Well, hi everyone and welcome to our kickoff session for our service learning project that we are uh, entitled, uh, we've, that we've entitled Open Educational Resources for College and Career Readiness. Uh, my name is Jennifer Madrill and today is February 18th and I'm so happy and pleased to have members of the Grace Centers of Hope uh, team with us today. We're going to run through their wish list. I'm going to give for those that are just new to the project and maybe aren't familiar with uh, with what we're doing. We'll give you a quick run through and um, and give you the opportunity through the text chat to uh, to ask some questions. And I just wanted to let everyone know this is a new interface for me. Um, it's a new interface obviously for everyone else that's on the call as well. So if you, we have any hiccups, I do want to hear about them. So just send me an email at the end or use the text chat and I'll, I'll try my best to multitask here today. Um, but have a little bit of patience, please, because this is a, a brand new piece of software for everybody involved. And so far, so good. We'll keep our fingers crossed that things go well. Um, so I just wanted to uh, give both Kim and Courtney an opportunity to introduce themselves. Um, Kim and Courtney are both in Michigan right now. And uh, I believe uh, Kim is on her computer. And I'm not sure if Courtney was going to dial in on her phone or not. But um, Kim, do you want to go ahead and just say a couple words and maybe tell us a little bit about what Grace Centers of Hope is all about and maybe give us a brief introduction to what you and uh, Courtney do? Okay, thank you. Um, I am the Director of Education and Career Development and Courtney is our Education Specialist. We are a um, homeless shelter. Primarily we serve people in our one year life skills program and anyone who comes into our one year life skills program that has not obtained their high school diploma or their GED elsewhere goes through um, our classroom to try and achieve that. Um, as someone wrote that yes, nonprofits are working in poverty and they are just as challenged as youth and families were working to help. So Daniel, thank you for that. I love that. Um, Courtney has been here just a very short time with the changes to the 2014 uh, GED standards. We uh, have been extremely um, pressed, hard pressed to find some great resources. So. Uh, when we had this opportunity through uh, Bonnie, and I'm sure Bonnie will speak, she is our uh, subject matter expert. She's on design. She's been working with us, and she was the one who got this all set up with, um, you know, through Jennifer. So uh, I am just so appreciative of everybody who's working on this project. You have no idea how much this means to us. And um, I think that's pretty much it. Is there anything else, Jennifer, that you wanted me to cover? Well, I just want to make sure I thank you guys right at the get-go. You're, you're our guinea pigs. <laughs> We've never tried this before. And so far, you've been excellent sports. You've tried everything I've thrown at you, whether it be this meeting like we're doing today or crazy things like Google Docs or whatever it might be. And and hopefully, I get fingers crossed, what we end up delivering in uh, 10 weeks' time is something that you can use and you'll be able to build on in the future. And I, I just thank you guys so much and thank you for the work you do every day and thank you again for being patient with us as we try to figure out ways to help you. Um, so with that I'm going to go ahead and um, just to do a couple quick slides as I said I know uh, some folks that are joining us today uh, this is a fairly new project and you may not be completely familiar with um, with it so I'm going to go through the um, first of all the thank yous which we, <laughs> which we just did and just run through real quickly what the general focus and the goals are for the project and um, as uh, Kim started to lay out for us the um, uh, the main focus is adult basic education so we're helping uh, Kim and Courtney as they work with uh, the clients that they serve to prepare for the GED test and uh, for those who may or may not be familiar with the GED test in 2014 it has changed substantially from a prior version it now aligns with the career and college readiness standards that were re uh, released by the Department of Ed in 2013, which then in turn um, have quite a, a, a dovetail with the K-12 standards, which I'm sure um, many folks on this call are, are familiar with um, as well. 
And so the way things um, tend to work when we're in my early conversations with uh, Bonnie, as we talked about, as Kim mentioned, Bonnie's name, and with Kim, uh, the main focus is tutored instruction. So it's folks working one-on-one -on -one or, or in a small group. And so that's going to be the focus of what we design. Um, another huge focus or, and, and goal for what we're trying to do is to do our best to not reinvent the wheel, but rather to go out and find ways to adapt and reuse existing open educational resources. Uh, it probably won't be resources that have been prepared for an adult audience. Um, as I mentioned, these are um, the, the GED test is very much aligned with K-12 Common Core standards, so we're hoping, fingers crossed, that when we go out, we're going to find some resources that have been um, carefully prepared and vetted for a K-12 audience that we're able to adapt and reuse. And then we'll throw that back into the universe as open educational resources for others. Um, and then <clears throat> in terms of the, um, the home base that we'd like to also create, um, we would like to have this, <clears throat> the teams work and create an exemplar. So we are obviously only in the 11 weeks that we have going to be able to create a certain amount of in, um, instructional resources. And so hopefully through this process, we'll be able to come up with a template a prototype that's, that works well and that others that come after us are able to then build on. And uh, part of that will also be then finding a home base for where these resources will be stored and shared with others. Um, and then <laughs> the, the last thing uh, is uh, probably our most important constraint uh, because we are working within the parameters of a semester for the students that are participating with us and the faculty. Uh, we're winding things down on May 3rd. So that gives us, uh, it gave us 11 weeks from the 15th. We're already halfway through this week. So we're down to 10 and a half weeks. And so uh, the clock has already started ticking. And um, that's going to be one of our biggest constraints as we move forward is just getting things off the ground as, as quickly as we can. The, uh, four, the three main projects that we've laid out is um, a pilot A, which is mining and mapping of additional, I'm, I'm sorry, of open educational resources. So again, probably finding a lot of K-12 resources we're hoping to adapt and reuse. The second group, we were going to have only one pilot B, but we had such a great response from students and from faculty that wanted to participate and uh, play along with us that we've expanded this to three different projects. So um, they are going to be working on developing an actual instructional unit, and Kim's going to talk in a moment. She has some pet projects she'd like those groups to think about and consider um, and ask them to focus on where there's a very dire need right now for them to have help on. Same thing with Pilot C. Um, the new GED, GED test, you, the students can no longer take it pencil and paper. Everything's moved to computer-based testing. And so um, unfortunately, this is a population that maybe has not had a lot of experience using computers for learning. And so Pilot C is going to be charged with coming up with an instructional unit that the students will be able to take before they, um, they attempt to take the, GE, the new format of the GED test. So that's, in a nutshell, what the three main project groups are. And I'm not going to spend a ton of time on the next slides because, first of all, it's probably too tiny for everybody to read. Um, but if you head over to our website, this is all laid out under the project team. But just I wanted to give a little schematic here. I like I, I like to think of things in charts. And so uh, you've met Kim already and Courtney's with her at Grace Centers of Hope. We also have established a project manager role. Uh, it's Gabrielle Blake. She's from Old Dominion University. And so she's going to be taking on the role of being a primary client liaison to Kim and Courtney. Um, I'm off, off there to the left with the other volunteers and subject matter experts, which we are blessed to have a great crew, and I'll, I'll mention them by name in a moment. And then uh, we have the three t teams laid out. For each team, there is a coordinating designer. It's almost like a mini project manager for just that pilot they're working on. Um, and then the team they're working on includes either three to four additional designers. So each team in total is four to five people. And uh, this is going to be way too tiny for everybody to read, but again, just to get a, a visual, we've got Team A, which has four designers. Uh, Elizabeth Simp Simpson has volunteered to be the coordinating designer. Um, pilot B, as I said, we have three different pilots running. Um, so we have either teams of four or a team of five for Pilot uh, B2. 
And then finally, Tet Pilot C has five folks on it. This is kind of a cool team. I, I tried my best as I was putting teams together to keep people together in terms of geography. But unfortunately, we've got Helen over on the West Coast, and we've got the, the students from University of Tampa over on the East Coast. So they are going to have some time zone issues. And I should have mentioned, um, I believe, and I could be wrong, but Preeti is on the call with us today. I believe right now she's sitting in India. And maybe Preeti, if you could comment in the text chat if I'm right or wrong on that. So it's not just a, uh, a program that we're, we're dealing with folks in time zones in the United States. I think we also have some global uh, time zone issues as well. I want to thank, I know we have some folks that are join, have joined us already that are some of our faculty sponsors and advisors. I saw Barb Paul's name pop in. She's been a huge supporter of us as we've been getting things kicked off. And I, just a huge thank you to everyone involved. Um, for the most part, the students that are participating, we're trying to figure out a way for them to include the experience as part of an internship or a practicum. For some of the students, for example, at um, University of Tampa, these are fulfilling course project requirements, and that's great. That's really the whole idea of a service learning project, the two-way street that we're providing a service to the nonprofit, and conversely, the students are getting the opportunity to get some college credit for it, and that's really uh, a main focus of what we're, we're hoping to achieve. Um, just thrilled to pieces, can't tell you how excited I am, that we have um, 19 college faculties that, uh, that are represented um, representing 15 different instructional design pro programs. So we really have a <laughs> huge reach way beyond what I uh, would ever have envisioned when we kicked this off. Um, and so uh, those college faculty are sponsoring either one to two students, which I, again, thank you, thank them so much for their, their time in helping us. And um, certainly not, last but not least, I want to thank, uh, huge thanks to our subject matter experts. Uh, we mentioned Bonnie Shelnett's name earlier. She's the reason we're here. She's uh, been a volunteer at Grace Centers of Hope and reached out to um, Monica Tracy, who then found me, and that's what got this whole ball ball rolling. Um, we also have a growing list of subject matter ex experts, either librarians or folks that are familiar with the GED. In fact, I just got an email this morning, another woman at Ball State University who um, is an expert in GED. Uh, she wants to join the team as a subject matter expert, so more, more the merrier there. So this list is actually growing today. Um, and we also have then just the advisory panel, no, I shouldn't say just, <laughs> we have as well the advisory panel that's just been helping me think of ways to develop and grow this platform. So um, thank you for indulging me on these last few slides, but I did want to just acknowledge everybody that has been um, so helpful in getting things up and running. And so with that, we'll, we'll turn to the, the nuts and bolts of what we're doing here, the key d design considerations. Um, we've we've kind of joked already with Kim that uh, we're dealing with um, not only a limited budget, but on this project, we have no money. Um, and so uh, first bullet point here, when I say money, we have none, seriously none, we have none, we're moving on. And so that's why we're using silly things like Google Sites to, uh, to house our home base. Uh, we're trying to do this on the cheap, and um, you can use it Google Sites for free. Uh, we're also very much focused on the open educational resource, which resources, which means anything that we produce is going to be openly licensed using Creative Commons licensing. The same thing is true then, just a note to the designer, my first of probably many warnings, anything that you do incorporate within the design of your instruction, um, if, if you're borrowing it from another source, we have to be able to legally use it, which means uh, we need to make sure it's, it also is openly licensed and has the appropriate Creative Commons licenses on it as well. So that's one warning. We'll probably have about 100 more before we get done with the 11 weeks. Uh, but that's a huge consideration because, we, again, we really want to put back what we're working on, put it back into the universe and let others use it. And the only way we can do that is if it's openly licensed. Um, in terms of media and technology, we've already joked a little bit today about um, <laughs> the need to keep things simple. Um, we're dealing with folks that may have low bandwidth, older hardware, uh, may not have the most up-to-date versions of software. As I mentioned, we have learners who may have never used computers for learning. So while we as designers love to test things out and, and try new tools, this probably is not the, the project for us to, to pull out all the bells and whistles that we really need to think about um, being able to accommodate all levels of learners, all levels of hardware and software. Um, same thing going forward, we're thinking about 
passing this project off to, uh, to students in the future who tend to be pretty good designers but not always great developers. At least that was my uh, situation when I was coming up as a master's student and a PhD student. My emphasis was much more on the instructional design, not necessarily the development. So we're fine with keeping things pretty simple, text, you know, pretty text heavy and uh, maybe incorporating some videos here and there or whatever it may be. But um, again, this is not really our opportunity to wow people with our crazy development skills because we need to think of those coming after who may need to adapt and, uh, and, and change and build upon what we've done. And which brings me uh, to a nice segue to my last bullet point here is that we really are trying to create something for the long term. And so everything that we develop, we need to think about who's coming after us. We need this to be sustainable and in sustainability is in terms of financial uh, resources. So um, again, not building things in, in cool, crazy, proprietary software that others can't um, access and modify, and also not build ourselves a home base or some type of thing that someone's down the road going to need to continue to fund um, to, uh, to keep things going. And I think all of this is very doable, but these are pretty important design considerations and constraints that we'll be asking the designers as well as their faculty sponsors and the subject matter experts to help us um, work on. And so with that, I think I'm going to turn it over to, um, to Kim and Courtney uh, to help walk us through what your, your uh, wish list is. And if, if everybody has the ability to click on the screen here, we have uh, a Google Doc started for Kim and Courtney where they've started to populate it with what their things are that they would love to see us develop. And so um, if everybody just wants to take a chance to either click on this, and I think I will also do the same. And um, Kim, did you want to go ahead and start explaining what you're looking for? Yes, thanks. Um, we took Jennifer's document that she came up, that she had with the pilot um, A, B, and C on there and kind of expanded it to include um, our wish list. So um, under the pilot A, mapping and mining of open education resources, um, that first bullet point there, the, the number one, that's Jennifer's that she had put there for the uh, English language arts and the mathematics. We would also like some mining and mapping of open ed resources for social studies and science. Um, not only if you could map just the social studies and science resources for our students, but if you could also find anything that the teachers or the tutors could use for materials on quizzing on content, that would be helpful as well. You know, not a not a need to have, but definitely a nice to have. And this is, you know, I realize we have such a short time to do this, but I would appreciate any help that you could get give us with um, the social studies and science piece as well. Um, also want to make sure that we could, you know, try to have the students be able to interact with the content. Um, some of the stuff, for example, in social studies gets very granular when you get out to maybe a resource of a video on the History Channel. And we need things that are maybe a little bit more broad versus a little bit more specific on time, like time frames or time, you know, overall time periods. Um, an overall overview on World War I, for example, or World War II. We have the students for a very brief time each week, just to give you kind of a background on that as well. Most of our students we see only on average in our classroom for six hours a week, which is a very short time. Some of our students, when we uh, use standardized testing, come in at a third or fourth grade level, and we need to get them, I would say probably through 10th grade is where they'll be finally assessed out at. That's as best as we can see, that would be around the standards for for their testing. Uh, under number two, you'll see that uh, in blue there is the link that leads to the GED assessment guide for educators. So we have listed the very specific assessment targets that they have set for the GED standards. And if you, um, 
if you click on that link, you should be able to see we have listed the pages there. For example, the reading assessment targets are on page 2.12 through 2.15, and they're pretty well laid out. So we've uh, the reading targets are there, the writing assessment targets are there, the language assessment targets are there, and um, you can follow that through there. Um, I'm sorry, I'm the only one on a headset, so I'll have to, Courtney, is there anything else we needed for that? Okay. So I, I did give an example, as I just spoke to, World War One and World War Two would be a screenshot of what we, we got off of that GED assessment guide, and it's very small on the screen right now. But you should be able to go in and click on that and and really take a good look at the specific targets. I think that's all we had on the pilot A. Uh, as far as pilot B, if we could have a specific wish to that with um, the design and development of one unit of instruction, I would love for that to be on the reading assessment target that we have listed there below. It's R9.1 and R7.1, and something that's very, very different in the 2014 is that the students need to be able to analyze two or more texts, and they need to be able to connect them in some way, and then they need to be able to write on that. And that is where we're seeing a big disconnect with our level of student is that they're not sure how to make that connection between two different pieces of um, of text. So for example, one might be an excerpt piece from Martin Luther King's um, letter from the Birmingham jail. Another might be an ex you know an excerpt from um, President Obama's inauguration speech, and they may say, read these two excerpts and then answer this prompt. You know, how are, you know, how have things changed? How are things, um, you know, how are things similar? So it's a lot of that compare and contrast um, and just really analyzing reading, and, and they're, they're not very good at making connections from two different pieces. So I think that's all we had on that piece. And then on Pilot C, our, um, some of our students who come in who are that younger generation, I'm maybe up to 30, and because of their background may have some computer experience. We have some folks that are a lot older, um, maybe up until f in their mid-50s, I would say, is our oldest client right now. And they um, they have such limited knowledge of using a computer that they don't even know what a mouse is or how to navigate with a mouse. So that's that's some of the level that we're, we're kind of dealing with. We think that um, for them to be able to complete the reading language arts and the social studies ex extended response parts of the 2014 GD, they should be able to be able to read through that, go through and make an outline, and then type if they could type a minimum of 20 words per minute. So I think that's our what we're seeing is our biggest challenge. Um, the current program that we're using is Mavis Beacon. However, it, it gives them a lot of typing experience without them looking at the keyboard. And I'm not so concerned about them looking at the keyboard to be able to type. I'm just looking at the end product being 20 words per minute. So in order for them to complete the reading language arts and social studies um, area of the of the test, you'll see that as you go through and you look at the standards for the GED, they also have to be able to drag and drop. They need to be able to click. They need to be able to click and fill in a space um, and you know type in letters and numbers. They need to be able to cut and paste within their own writing section and um, they, they, at this point, many of them don't 
even know how to highlight text to be able to do that. So that's our big challenge with the um, with the computer part. Uh, also, just as a uh, overview of, of of all of this, we do want to make sure that any kind of design questions go to Bonnie, and Bonnie, you may want to speak to that. And then as far as subject matter expert on content for GED, you can refer those things to Courtney, and she would be able to assist you. But it also sounds like we may have another resource for that as well, Jennifer. Yeah, and uh, we really haven't had a lot of chance to talk with our um, subject matter experts to see how we're going to actually engage them, which is going to be interesting mm -hmm. how they're going to yes. be able to uh, receive and respond to questions. But you brought up um, a great segue to for us to introduce Bonnie. Bonnie, did you want to speak for a little bit about um, your general goals for the project that maybe we haven't covered yet? Okay. Uh, uh, when we started, or when I uh, uh, joined Grace Centers uh, this past summer, uh, I'm recognizing that the GED was changing drastically and that uh, the resources that were available were limited and even the uh, providers, the service providers for the GED right now do not have all of the things that they need to have. So uh, I, we began to see what the gap was, and that was in resources. Uh, and um, while there are some uh, great resources out there for uh, college preparation, we recognize that this student population is unique, maybe not unique uh, in of itself, but unique for the type of um, people uh, that are wanting to get a GED that if they don't have the computer skills that that is a key thing that they need to be able to obtain so that's one of the key goals and that those uh, types of uh, instruction for that need to be uh, recognizing as Kim said very basic um, the, the design part that, I'm, that I would like to uh, bring to this um, is recognizing that uh, these students are going to be need to, we're going to need to show them something, whether that would be in graphics or uh, a little bit of animation, and then they need to pr practice. So I would say uh, show, practice, and feedback and uh, as much as possible and to give them the opportunity to see these things in chunks. So my goal as a designer would be to say, I would like to see things happening in small chunks so that we don't have 20 pages of something before they have an opportunity to interact. So I'm not trying to set uh, a, a limit, but uh, you see what I'm, I'm, we're getting at, chunking it. Uh, making it, uh, someone asked uh, about the reading level. Kim did mention that, that uh, some people are as low as the fourth grade reading level, but I think that that doesn't mean that you change, that you use a fourth grade vocabulary, but that you use language that is very clear, very active, rather than the academic past, you know, uh, forget academic past tense we're not you know that this is uh, very much for people who need to be able to read it clearly so short sentences but still very relevant so I would add to the the show the tell the practice the feedback chunking it and making it relevant so those six things are key to all of this Excellent, Bonnie, and, and thank you again for being the, <laughs> getting the snowball rolling, I guess. We'll call mm -hmm. you the, <laughs> the snowball mm -hmm. starter here. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, just a bit of background, Bonnie has um, her PhD from Wayne State, so um, she very much gets what we're doing here, and she's an instructional designer by training and by practice, so uh, she knows of what she speaks. Um, and so I wanted to uh, be... Uh, you know, we have folks here that have to get back and, and start helping people, so I, I want to wind things down here as, as soon as I can, but I do want to let folks on the team know what our next steps are. Uh, I'd like you to please continue your team introductions as well as um, 
just your um, your meetings that you may be having individually within your project groups. I think this is that time of awkwardness when we're just starting out a project and we have a super uh, uh, divide here in that most of us have never met. I wouldn't know if I bumped into 90% of the people on this project team, if I bumped on <laughs> into them on the street, I wouldn't know who they were. So uh, really, it's it's no exaggeration to say that hardly anyone on this team um, of 50 some people know each other or, or know each other well. Um, so you know, just embrace it, embrace the fact that nobody knows each other. And it's like, we're all in our first day of school. So get out there and, um, and, and do start your informal introductions. I do have a meeting set up. We're trying to get a, a date and time set up this week with just the coordinating designers to make it a kind of a smaller manageable group um, to kind of build off of what we just talked about here. And also to really start hammering on this third bullet point, um, which is roughing out the design plans. And this is going to be really interesting. When I teach instructional design classes, classes at Old Dominion, we have a version of what a design plan looks like. As I said, we've got 15 different design schools that are um we're working with. So everybody may have a very different version uh, in their minds of what I mean by a design plan. But for the purposes of our um, assignment and our project for uh, for us here, uh, we, we need to do this. We need to have some document for each team that is outlining what your plan is as you turn that corner and start uh, developing your, um, your instruction. Because we have uh, some important things to make sure we're not overlapping, uh, yet at the same time we are um, making sure from a style standpoint and from a um, instructional standpoint, as Bonnie mentioned, the, that each instruction ex, instructional unit should include the you know presentation, opportunities for practice, opportunities for feedback, and we want we want to make sure that each group is hitting those things. And so the way we're uh, planning on attacking that from a logistical standpoint is asking that all of the design teams have a design plan that's stored within the Google Drive that at any point your advisor or anybody else who wants to look can click on that and see okay this is what they're they intend to do and the reason we're doing it in a Google Doc and in a Google Google Drive um, same as with the wish list that Kim just presented is you have the comment feature and so let's please use that and so as you're reading through uh, each other's design plans and uh, this goes for everybody uh, on the team facilitators and advisors and whoever it may be uh, if you see something interesting say so if you see say uh, see something that you think may be going down the wrong path say so uh, use the comment feature we also have um, a section on our website that's dedicated to community outreach so even if you're not specifically on the team we would love to hear from you and the way we're trying to um, we're, we're kind of evolving each day trying to figure out different ways that we can reach out to folks that aren't necessarily on our project team but if you would, would wouldn't mind if you're writing anything about the project on Twitter or on Facebook if you could use the hashtag um, hashtag OERCCR uh, we have the ability to aggregate all of those posts and pull it back on the website. And so if you have links or resources that you want us to consider, that's one way to do it. We've also set up a Google Plus community, and um, it's kind of growing. I think the last check we were right around 20 or so people that had um, signed up for that, but certainly we have the capacity for a lot more people. Um, and then uh, I plan to have these live webinars. I, I'm saying weekly-ish. We'll see how that, <laughs> that pans out. But at, at, a, at a very minimum, from my standpoint, I am going to be documenting project management updates on our website. And um, I will do that for sure weekly, just to give folks a recap of what we did the prior week and what I'm looking for the project to do in the week ahead. And so again, you can find that on the website, which is right here. And as I said, we have no money, so we're <laughs> using Google Sites. Um, so it's uh, sites.google.com slash sites slash OER for CCR. And, um, and that's all I had, guys. Um, thank you so much to Kim and uh, to Courtney and to Bonnie. Um, did anybody want to say any last words before uh, anything we may have missed in the last 30 minutes that we should have said? Yes, uh, Jennifer. I, oh, sorry, oh, Jennifer. This is Kim. I am on um, vacation from February 1st through the 15th, so Courtney will be your main contact during that time. Okay, great. And uh, I did uh, discuss with Kim just before the meeting started that uh, I appreciate the, what you've mentioned about the logistics and the project plan, but that <clears throat> maybe we should discuss uh, in the next week uh, a, an interim review uh, of where that deadline is, is going to occur uh, before, before May 3rd. So whether that's a one-time or a 
and I know we can go into Google, Google Docs, but that maybe we have one for all of the groups that ha we have some target uh, deadlines or review times uh, uh, before the May 3rd deadline. That's okay. a great, yeah, that's a great suggestion. And so when I um, speak with the coordinating designers, we'll talk about that as far as, mm -hmm. um, and they're, like I said, they're kind of mini project managers on their team. Well, right. uh, that's a great suggestion that we'll try to get in the next couple of weeks to at least start roughing something out so we can start having right. checkpoints to start adding our comments and, and, uh, and feedback. Um, oh, go ahead. So, sorry, Bonnie. We're I, I want to say my thank you to you, Jennifer. Uh, because uh, my being on the client side and a, a service provider to clients, you have done, you have just gone over and above. This is excellent. And uh, the hours that you have put into this, uh, I, I appreciate uh, so much. And so I'm thankful to uh, Monica for pr providing you as our resource. And then you're getting all of these wonderful people and reading their introductions, I am, uh, I, I feel humbled and and happy that we have such a, a large group of people who are so experienced and who are uh, uh, well, committed and really want to see something worthwhile and all for free. I mean, I I'm just amazed. It, it is amazing. I, I when I. Uh... Wrote, talked to folks back in October at uh, the convention, the ACT convention, and I stood there by li my little table and tried to draw people in. I didn't know if I'd find six people that were interested in the fact that we got th the interest mm -hmm. level we have. is It's absolutely incredible. And it, for me, it's a labor of love. I, I'm, I'm, this is why I got into instructional design, and uh, I'm just glad that we, we found a way that we could channel all of our collective efforts to some some positive good. So um, thank you to everybody. And uh, this recording will be posted on our website, as will everything that we do. And any suggestions, you know where to find me. Um, you can just go to jmadrill at designersforlearning.org. And everything, uh, I, I'll, I'm open to any suggestions. <laughs> Not saying we can incorporate all of them, but I certainly would love to hear everything you have to share with us. So thank you, Kim. And thank you, Courtney and Bonnie. And we'll see everybody on the next uh, live session. Thank you. Bye-bye.